Welcome to our Social Responsibility Day. This is a tradition at MDI High School that we've done for a couple of decades now, uh, to take a, a time out of our regular routine of school in the spring. Uh, kind of, a, I always feel like it's the launch of the spring season, the first of the, the rites of passage that we do as we get closer and closer to the end of the school year, which is not that far away. Um, and today we're lucky to have a really broad program uh, that ha gives you a chance to explore different different parts about social responsibility and our focus today is on anti-bias and anti-racism. And so we have, uh, you've seen the, the schedule for the day, uh, we're starting out this morning with the keynote address and I'm going to read our speaker's bio and then after I do that I just want to remind you all about being a good audience. We haven't done this since most of you have been in high school and I think it's really important, even though it seems obvious, let's be a good audience. And that means having our attention, having our eyes up here, having our phones out of sight. If you have to get up and use the restroom, these ones are open today. Just do it subtly and let's be great MBI hosts. Now I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker. Anthony Cullen is an historian, author, and explorer of the American past. An early purveyor of experiential history, Cohen launched his career in 1996, walking two months from Maryland to Canada along a route of the Underground Railroad. Cohen is the founder and president of the Monaire Foundation, Inc., the national nonprofit organization that is, quote, preserving the legacy of the Underground Railroad and operates the Button Farm Living History Center, a 40-acre farm depicting 1850s plantation life in Maryland. Welcome, Anthony Cohen. Thank you. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, oh, there we go. I can hear myself now. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, this is a little awkward for me um, as well. It's the first time in over two years I've spoken to a live audience, um, so I'm hoping it will all come back. Uh, and I'd uh, like to thank the uh, uh, staff uh, here at your school uh, for the invitation, uh, and especially uh, my cousin, uh, Jill Cohen, who will be um, uh, commandeering uh, the uh, PowerPoint for me today. So first of all, um, go to the first one. Yes, me. Yes, wasn't I cute? Um, I always start with this uh, photograph, uh, so you'll know that I was a kid once. Um, yep. It's all about the details. So um, I'm Tony Cohen, I am a historian. I'm from Washington, D.C., was born in Washington, D.C., currently live in Montgomery County, Maryland. And um, 1963 was when I was born. Uh, this uh, photo is from about 1968, spring of 1968, which was a seminal year in my life. Uh, my family had lived uh, in, in D.C. and uh, moved to the Maryland suburbs about two weeks before Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and uh, riots um, uh, emerged uh, uh, in our city. And so I grew up uh, kind of out of the spotlight of what was happening uh, nationally and lived a kind of uh, bucolic uh, childhood um, uh, in suburbia. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, about my family is both of my parents are African-American uh, and our last name is Cohen, uh, which is a Jewish last name, but neither of my parents are Jewish. And when we moved from the city to the suburbs, we actually moved to a place called Kemp Mill, which was a Jewish community settled by Holocaust survivors in the 1950s. So when the black Cohens moved in, I'm sure it was a bit of a surprise, but no one spoke of differences. So no one ever asked me as a child, how does a black guy end up with the Jewish last name? But later, as I grew up and moved to other places, people asked me this question all the time. So as an adult in 1989, I called my grandfather, my father's father, who was living in LA at the time, and I said, Granddad, how did we end up 
with this unique last name. And he said that his father, my great-grandfather, had been born in Philadelphia, uh, black, born in Philadelphia, uh, orphaned, and then adopted by a Jewish family from Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and this was fascinating to me. I'd never heard this story before. And uh, this launched me on a personal journey that I'm still on today, uh, trying to uncover my family roots. So I started uh, calling all sorts of family members and asking them every detail about our family history on both sides of, uh, of my family, dad and mom. And I learned a lot. Um, I became an avid genealogist. I would spend all my spare time at the National Archives or at the Latter-day Saints Library digging up family history. And by 1992, I had documented 10 different uh, ethnicities, uh, um, uh, places of origins on three different continents. And I discovered or believed that the history of the world actually flowed through my veins. Um, that love of family history translated to a love of history in general. And so in 1992, um, I returned to school, to American University, and uh, pursued a history degree. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with that degree, but I just loved uh, researching and hunting down information um, uh, and exploring the past. Well, for my senior project, I was given the assignment to write a paper about some part of American history that had gone unrecorded. I chose the topic of the Underground Railroad. And the reason for that was the Underground Railroad, I'm sure as many of you know, was a secret route of escape for uh, urban and plantation uh, slaves throughout the South to escape along to get to a place of freedom, mainly in the North. And at the time I took the assignment, all I knew was that um, the uh, Underground Railroad was headed by Harriet Tubman and um, that it went north. Um, so I chose my county, Montgomery County, Maryland, as my focus of study. And uh, Montgomery County is right next to Washington, D.C. And it's about 40 miles south of the Pennsylvania line. Pennsylvania was a free state. Maryland was a slave state. So I figured that this secret path must have passed through some of the communities that I lived in. Well, how do you find something which by its very nature is not supposed to be found? It was an illegal system, it was clandestine, and many of its secrets went to the graves uh, of those people who traveled uh, that route. Well, the first thing I did was I went to our local historical society. And I said, what can you tell me about the Underground Railroad? And the archivist there said, um, what, do you, um, what kind of project are you working on? And I told her, and she said, well, I can save you the trouble now because Montgomery County was a Southern county in a Southern state. We were uh, for the Confederacy and runaway slaves wouldn't have gotten any help here. And I thought that was an interesting statement. And uh, she said, uh, in fact, in the 1860, 11, uh, 1860 election, only five people in our county voted for Abraham Lincoln. And she said, and they were Quakers. And I'm like, great, where do I find the Quakers? So we had a Quaker community, and um, I actually went there and started talking to the oldest people, one of whom lived in a house which was a station on the Underground Railroad. And once I interviewed that person, I began to find more information and the history opened before me. Next, please. So, the Underground Railroad. Um, uh, most of us probably have this idea about the Underground Railroad as um, a system of escape where uh, people traveled uh, mainly at night under the cloak of darkness, um, uh, probably escaping barefoot, exposed to the elements. They get to the first safe house, 
where friendly Quakers come out and give them food and shelter and whatnot. As I started researching, um, I discovered a completely different story, that it was actually a system that began in the South and was constructed by the very people who made the escapes. So as they went along, they had to take the first steps, uh, sometimes traveling hundreds of miles to reach free soil in the North. But once they got there, then it became more highly automated and people were passed along, not by foot, but by horse uh, and buggy and by train and so forth until they could reach the Canadian line. Next, please. Um, some of, and I'm not sure what you can see from there, but um, some of the um, uh, uh, things that helped me discover the Underground Railroad um, was a uh, historical document. I went to uh, my local courthouse uh, in Montgomery County, and I found cases of people who had been arrested and tried for harboring runaway slaves. So that gave me insight. I found slave narratives, and these were like autobiographies or biographies written by the people who escaped and got to freedom, telling their story. And in that, they gave a lot of details about the roots and the people involved. There were runaway slave notices. So when someone escaped, their owner would put an ad in the local paper and give a lot of, as much description as possible so they could be identified, pursued, and return. So all of this stuff uh, added up. Next, please. Well, uh, in the course of my project, I documented three safe houses uh, uh, that were used in my county, six routes of escape, and over 30 points of interest which helped tell the Underground Railroad story. I wrote my paper, I got an A, and then I graduated with a history degree. And then I faced a mystery greater than that of the Underground Railroad. What do you do with a history degree? I still don't know. Um, but um, I, uh, I remember um, going back to the, uh, arch uh, to the county archives, and the same woman who said that there was no Underground Railroad in Montgomery County said, hey, weren't you working on a paper about the Underground Railroad? How did that turn out? And I said, well, I actually found it. And she asked to read it. And she said, this is amazing scholarship. She said, would you consider the Historical Society getting a grant to publish your paper as a book? And I was like, well, yeah, yeah, that'd be great, sure. And so that's my book, um, The Underground Railroad uh, in Montgomery County, a history and driving guide. So it was history, but then you could get on a in your car and you could drive the route and see all the sites. 500 copies were printed. Um, six weeks later, all had been sold. School system bought them, um, a local bookstore. It was an instant bestseller. Um, it didn't make me rich, but um, it let me know that um, this hidden history was something that uh, really sparked interest in people. That was really important, and so I went on. Well, shortly after it came out, I was invited to speak to my first school group, uh, which is it's always daunting, and, um, but this is the first one, and it was uh, fourth graders, which is like the toughest audience in the world. Um, and um, so I remember going in, and it was a uh, room about maybe a quarter of the size of this, and there's about 200 students, and um, I'm like, just don't make it boring to me. So um, instead of just giving them all these facts about uh, history and the Underground Railroad, um, I told them stories about how the Underground Railroad operated in their community, including uh, one of the main roads uh, in our county, uh, uh, which is near where their school was. And my, I was telling the stories about people who, who had come up that road and uh, where they were hidden and so forth. And one boy raised his hand and said, Mr. Cohen, were you afraid when you escaped on the Underground Railroad? <laughs> Thinking I was a runaway slave who had come to tell my story. And uh, first of all, I said, I'm not that old kid. Uh, thanks very much. But, um, but um, then I thought, wow, what an amazing question. 
What if any of us could go back in time, live the lives of our ancestors for even one day, and then come forward in time and share with the living what we had learned? Well, I didn't have a time machine, and it was, you know, whatever. Um, but um, I remember going home, and I'm thinking about this, and um, then uh, it was probably two weeks later, I got an idea. And uh, I thought, well, what if I were to start out on one of the routes that I had documented and started walking? Uh, and followed that route and asked people along the way what they knew about the Underground Railroad. Would that lead me to other places, uh, new information, uh, future discoveries? Um, I thought, wow, that could be a really incredible project. And if it worked, I could end up walking from Maryland all the way to Canada. But then I thought, yeah, that's not very practical because it would take weeks or months and, uh, you know, uh, I have to take off work and all of this. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm unemployed right now. Yes, I can actually do this trip. So at the time, it was between two jobs, and uh, there was a three-month gap. So I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk to Canada. Um, and um, one of the things I will just say um, that I've learned about walking routes of the Underground Railroad um, is uh, that adrenaline was one of the chief fuels used on the Underground Railroad. You get an idea, you're prompted to do something, you just start moving, and you think about it later. So um, I started going to schools and promoting this walk that I was going to take. And I started asking the kids, how would you make the journey? Um, and um, they came up with uh, all sorts of uh, 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 crazy ideas of how I could uh, take the, the shortest route, um, uh, the most urban or rural routes. Uh, uh, school kids uh, uh, planned what I would pack uh, 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 in my backpack. And uh, uh, one math class figured out uh, how many miles I'd have to walk a day in order to reach my destination at time. So it became a real community project. Um, uh, next, please. So, in uh, May, I think it was May 4th, 1996, I started out on my journey. Um, I had a web page that was sponsored by the National Park Service because some of the places I was going to travel through were actually national parks that had uh, underground railroad history. And um, we put up an itinerary, itinerary of my walk with a general route I would take. Um, but we put a notice saying, if you see me coming to your town and you have information, let me know. Because I can switch and, and, and move uh, around fluidly from place to place. Well, leading up to the walk, uh, that website started getting e uh, a lot of email. Now this was 1996, and the web was still fairly young. Um, but people, uh, were not only giving suggestions about where I might find the story of the Underground Railroad, but saying, hey, I see from the map, Tony's gonna be coming near my town. I'd like to put him up for the, for the night. And so by the time I got on the road, I had a place to stay every night of what would become an eight week journey to Canada. Um, so a few of the facts. Um, I walked 10 to 25 miles a day. Uh, 10 miles usually took about three and a half hours. A full 25 mile day was 12 hours. That included stops along the way. So I'd look for libraries, historical societies, museums, and I stopped there and asked them what information they had on the Underground Railroad. If I couldn't find any of those, I'd always stop at a post office in a small town because the postmaster always knows who the oldest person is or who the town historian is. In lieu of that, I'd stop at a realtor's office because they knew the history of the oldest homes in the community. And they'd pick up the phone and say, hey, Barbara, um, this guy is walking to Canada. Can you let him into your basement? And so then I was able to actually see some of these places. It happened just like that. Um, uh, I was traveling early spring, so um, I was uh, usually uh, exposed to the elements. 
And every weekend, friends of mine, family or, or friends from D.C. would come up and join me on the journey. Um, I carried a backpack with uh, initially uh, six changes of clothes and rations for about three days at a time. But after the first week, with people putting me up at their house, I would arrive there, they'd feed me dinner, they'd uh, give me breakfast, and then they'd send me off with the lunch. So I no longer had to carry food. And I reduced the amount of clothing down to three uh, pairs because they were allowing me to do laundry while I was there as well. So I was able to um, uh, move quicker and, and faster and in a more smart way. Uh, and you can see me here. This is me, the leaner, fitter, spelter me uh, there walking to Canada. There are places uh, uh, where I could actually see where um, uh, the travelers were hidden. Uh, I eventually got to Canada, and uh, by that time I was a little bit of a celebrity and uh, got all these awards and keys to all these Canadian cities that I'll never be able to use. And then over there, that's me with Oprah Winfrey. She read about my journey, had me on her show, and she had a replica of a box, and I will tell you about that in a minute, and that's what I'm pictured next to. Next, please. So, I get to Philadelphia. I'm just going to tell you one specific story uh, from my journey. I get to Philadelphia. It's about 10 days into my walk, and um, I'm speaking to a group of fifth graders this time, and I'm telling them about my journey, and, you know, they have all the questions, and uh, one of them was, um, what was the greatest escape on the Underground Railroad? And I said, well, I don't know what the greatest escape was, because uh, many people, uh, it's believed up to 30,000 people uh, escaped on the Underground Railroad between the year 1830 and uh, the uh, outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, and many of those stories we don't know. But I'll tell you my favorite, and I told the story of Henry Box Brown, a man from uh, enslaved in Richmond, who in 1848 escapes, I'm sorry, 49, escapes on a route of the Underground Railroad. But he had many miles to go and didn't know how to get there. So he um, went to a friend of his, a white man, uh, who was a shoemaker in Richmond, who was a, a friend and a trusted person for him. And he said, I need to get to freedom or I'm gonna be sold to the Deep South. So the man, who was named Smith, put him in a crate and mailed him to freedom. 26 hours by um, uh, horse and buggy, by steamship, and by train to reach Philadelphia, uh, all the while inside the crate. Uh, when he gets there, the box is delivered to the office of William Still, the chief uh, uh, station master of the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia. And Still and his um, uh, accomplices surround the box, they pry open the lid, and there they find the body of Henry Box Brown, who after a moment stirs, he raises to his feet a free man in the north. The kids were like, wow, how did you go to the bathroom? And you know, questions like, kid questions. And I said, well, fortunately, history does not record that tidbit. Yes, we don't know how he used the bathroom. But again, I thought, what a great story. What if someone could get in the box with Henry? What if that journey had been uh, recovered? Well, by this time, I was 10 days into my walk and actually falling behind because every place I stopped, people not only took me in, but they said, would you come speak you know, to my school group? And so uh, my walk was being slowed down and uh, I was losing time on my schedule. And I just remember thinking, yeah, I wish I had a box and I could just ship myself to New York like Henry did and then make up the time. And then I thought, wait a minute, why don't I get a box? Why don't I get inside the box and ship myself and see what that was like? Yeah, it was pretty stupid. Anyway, um, so this is a promotional picture of me. Um, I didn't actually dress like a runaway slave on my journey. Um, and this is an image of uh, Henry Box Brown 
emerging for, from his crate and uh, a picture uh, of his crate. Next, please. Well, um, so I got this idea in my head and I couldn't get it out. I was going to put myself in a crate and I was going to experience part of the journey a la Henry Box Brown. Now, when I started on this journey, it was to follow a path and collect information along the way. But as I went from place to place, what I discovered was not only the history of the Underground Railroad, but its resonance at that time and place. What it meant to communities, um, um, how they felt about issues of race and identity and um, kind of our, na our, our national culture. And then I began wondering, um, here I was on you know, this physical landscape, but that the people who traveled it were on also an emotional landscape. What other dimensions of the Underground Railroad could I discover? So I actually went in a box because I thought that would put me closer to the emotional journey that someone like Henry went on. So, um, friends of, uh, of mine came up um, that weekend. We bought $88 worth of lumber and we constructed a crate which was 24 by 28 by 30 inches tall. And that gave me enough room to sit uh, cross-legged uh, uh, in the box. Um, and uh, if the box were to be jostled, all I had to do was push my hands against the walls and that would keep me from tumbling around. Um, the box had uh, four sides, a top and a bottom. The front uh, section was actually on hinges, so it was a trap door, which could open and shut uh, uh, with me controlling it from the inside. And on the back side of the box, we put wheels, and that way, when the box needed to be moved, I was tipped on my back and rolled along. Uh, we put eye hooks on the, um, the bottom, so ropes could be uh, looped through and attached to a pallet. And then I got in the box. It was fairly comfortable, um, not very spacious, um, but I fit snugly inside. The only thing that was concerning me was the lack of air. It got stuffy in there very quickly. So one of my friends got a drill and drilled holes, five holes on each side, about a quarter, uh, size of a quarter in uh, diameter, and then all sorts of fresh air started flowing through. The only problem then was anyone could just walk up to the box, look in the hole, see me sitting there, and it would kind of uh, uh, defeat the purpose because the box was to be smuggled onto an Amtrak train. And we figured that if we told Amtrak what we were gonna do, that they were gonna say no. Um, but I also figured if uh, someone like Henry Botts Brown told his owner, hey, I'm leaving you, I'm escaping to freedom, the answer would be no. So I tried to take a page from Henry's book. I would do the journey clandestinely, clandestinely which also meant I would do it illegally. It is illegal to transport yourself in a crate on a train. And this was pre-9-11. But um, I figured uh, the worst thing that could happen to me is I get caught in the act, I'd be arrested, and my story would make the front uh, page of every newspaper across the nation. I'd get lots of publicity uh, for the walk, and then someone would have sympathy on me and um, you know give me a light sentence. So uh, I get my friends there, we construct the crate. Um, we were then um, uh, decided uh, that we would travel the next day, which was Sunday, May 17th. Um, should have been a beautiful spring day, but it was the first day of a three-day heat wave. Uh, the box is put in a van. Uh, at 10.30, we arrive at the uh, 30th Street uh, train station at 11.30. The temperature outside the station on the sign was 89 degrees. By uh, the end of the day, when I would reach New York, the temperature had peaked at 99 degrees, and it was always about four to five degrees warmer in the box than the outside air temperature. 
And that's because I was producing heat and steaming up the inside myself. Well, the box is put on its wheels, it's rolled into the station, uh, thanks please, uh, rolled into this station, and my journey began. Um, I remember uh, my two accomplices, Bill and Suni, um, uh, were trying to figure out what to do with the box. Suni goes and gets a porter who comes back and said, is this the box you're shipping? And she said, yes. And he says, where's it going to? And I can hear this from inside the box. She said, New York City. And he said, uh, tickets please? She said, we don't have our tickets yet. He's like, ma'am, you're gonna have to get tickets. Uh, come back and see me then. Um, uh, you'll have to fill out the paperwork quickly in order for you to get on the train, but you can leave the box with me and I will get it on the next train. And she said, oh no, 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 the box is traveling with us. And he said, that box is not going on the next train. There's not enough time to get it on. And she said, but I can't be separated from the box. And he said, is there something I should know about the box? And she said, yeah, it's full of jewelry and family heirlooms, and I'm not leaving it with you. And he said, suit yourself, but you can't get on this train, and the next train going to New York comes in at 3.30, and you will arrive at 6. So my two-hour journey in the box then turned into essentially a six-and-a-half journey, uh, hour journey in the box. Well, they go away. Suni leans over the box. Tell me, did you hear that? And I'm like, yes, Zuni. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, where are we? In the middle of the station. And I said, okay, stop talking to the box. You're going to think you're a weirdo. <laughs> so they push the box into an alcove and um, uh, start talking to it again. And we just agreed that it would stay in the box until it was time to get on, on, on the next train. But the deadline was 1 o'clock to get the box checked in. So just before 1, they come get me. They roll me up to the counter. They got get the box on the scales. I weigh in at 210 pounds, uh, me and the box uh, in total. The cost to ship that, the cost to ship that one way was, 70, uh, was $25. The cost of each of the coach tickets for Bill and Suni to be on the train was $75 each. So it's cheaper to go by crate than coach, but don't try it. <laughs> so so um, they, they, they get me on, uh, I'm taken from them, put on a conveyor belt, then on an elevator, and I end up on the platform of the station awaiting the train. And I won't go into all the details, but just give you a few impressions. Um, within the first hour, I was sweating so hard in the box that all of my clothes were drenched. Within 30 minutes, I was able to get rid of my clothes down to my boxer shorts. Um, within a half an hour of that, there was so much uh, uh, steam in the box that uh, condensation was forming on the screw plates which held the, the lid to the, to the walls. And every 20 minutes or so, a drop of water would fall from the cha chamber um, uh, onto me. It was like the box was sweating for me. Um, one time, uh, the box was sitting on the loading dock and a truck moved up, uh, backed up to it and started idling, which would have been fine, but then the fumes started filling. And then the, someone got in the truck and left. And ho the whole time that I was um, constructing the crate, I had conveniently forgotten that I'm a lifelong claustrophobic person. So I was like, what the heck, Tony? Um, one time, um, a forklift came, picked up the box, and started moving me around. Now this was cool, because every time it uh, rounded a corner, air was forced through the cracks of the crate, and it began driving down the temperature inside. Finally, when the train arrived, the door to the freight car was rolled open, I was put inside. Beep, 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 boom. Sound reverberated through the box, and then the machine withdrew. And then another parcel was put in. Beep, 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 boom, right down next to me. The machine withdrew, the door was closed, all light extinguished, and now I knew I was in the freight car alone. But there was that other box, and I was like, hello, anyone there? But you know, no one answered, so it was fine. Um, and then the journey started. Um, uh, at one point, the, 
door across me, uh, which hadn't been latched, rolled open. And uh, I could see light pouring through. That was kind of scary. I had control of the trap door, which I had always thought that once I was on the train, I would just open the door and get out, enjoy the ride, and just before we reach the destination, I'd get back in the box and so forth. But when I went to open the door, um, the ropes that were used to tie the box to the pallet were keeping me from opening the door. And all the while, um, um, I felt uh, like the conditions were deteriorating. You know, initially I was sweating, I got out of my clothes, and then I just sweated more until there was like a sticky mucilage covering me. Eventually that stopped altogether, and my body was covered in a white milky sheen. It was like the salt and minerals were coming out of my pores, and it really scared me. Well, then the train lurches, and then begins slowing, and then starting to go on a decline. And we were going under the river into Manhattan, and my journey was coming to an end. After all that time, I had reached New York City. And the train comes to a stop, engine shuts off. I am in freedom in New York. Yes, and five minutes, 10 minutes, and the engine strikes up again. Next stop, Boston. Where are my friends? Well, they had gotten off the train. They had the shipping bills. They uh, went to the guy. He looked it up in the computer and he said, I'm sorry, your box isn't on this train. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we put it on. He said, did you see it go on in Philadelphia? They said, no. He said, this happens all the time. They get left on the platform, fill out this paperwork. We can usually find them within 72 hours and we'll call you. Bill said, no way. He said, I want to check, check all the um, cards. And in the final one, they see the box. Um, both, uh, uh, so, so his shipping label said, Bill Corey, care of Penn Station, New York City. The one on the box said, Bill Corey, care of Sunnydale Farms, Brooklyn, New York. And it's a milk processing plant that makes the little cardboard milks that go into school lunches. That's where they were going to send me via Boston. Made no sense. Anyway, they get me off. They roll me into an elevator and into the main concourse of Penn Station. And this was just a beautiful moment. They're rolling me through. I can hear the uh, announcer calling the arrivals and departures. Um, I could hear uh, people talking to loved ones. It was just the sounds of life. And I was so happy just to be alive. It was a really magical moment. And the box stopped. And Zuni said, Tony, are you in there? I'm like, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm in here. And um, she, I, I said, where are we? She said, in the middle of the train station. I said, stop talking to the box. <laughs> and so they roll me into an alcove again. And um, I, 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 she taps on the box. She says, you can come out. I open the box. And the door hits um, like, a, like a little counter. And the lettering said Amtrak police, and I got right back in. They had pushed me in the security guard's alcove. Well, fortunately, there were no security guards right there. I wasn't caught. They get me up to ground level, and that's when my journey and my story comes to an end. Um, if you've ever been to uh, uh, Penn Station in New York City, it's right across from Madison Square Garden. And on a Sunday, there's always a concert or a game going on, so they cordon off all the streets. So when people come out of the venue, they can get to uh, the subway and the trains without hindering traffic. So there I am. Bill is filming it on this side. Suni is doing a dance or something over here. She says, Tony, you may come out now. You are a free man. And I open the door and I crawl out, fist triumphant to the sky. Uh, Bill's filming. Uh, wearing nothing but my boxer shorts. The doors to Madison Square Garden fly open. Hundreds of people pass by me. Not one person turned to look at me. They probably thought I lived in the box. That's New York for you. But it was one of the most exhilarating moments of my life. Next, please. And next, please. See, I missed all my cues. Next, please. Yes. And. Yeah, let's get this next. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So 
what did I learn from all of this? Well, first of all, um, I will say that in 1989, when I asked my grandfather how we got the family name, um, I knew nothing about my family origins. And then within a couple of years, as I said, I had uh, documented that I was from like 10 different uh, uh, cultural and ethnic backgrounds. In 2018, I actually had an ancestry DNA test done, and it confirmed all the places um, uh, that, that I descend from uh, ancestrally. But I love this because the, the map just shows, um, shows me as part of the world, and that we all have a story in us, perhaps one we know, but most likely stories we don't know, that we carry along through time. Um, um, next, please. And for the journey itself, I learned uh, many things, but three things that were really important that I just want to share with you to close. Discovery. Um, to obtain sight or knowledge of something for the first time. Um, life is full of all sorts of journeys of discovery. And um, keeping your eyes open, um, being aware of people around you um, is what is going to enable you to discover um, really the secrets and the magic of the world. Um, I learned about empathy, uh, the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experiences of another. Um, while I descended from enslaved people, um, I grew up in the suburbs and felt very privileged in my life. And it actually took getting in the box for me to really understand what some of my ancestors must have gone through. And so we carry history, but sometimes we're not even connected to it until we actually go to the places where they were and experience or try to experience what they did. But the most important thing is connectivity. Connectivity is how relationships are magnified, how ideas are passed along, and how traditions are shared from generation to generation. And that's the journey we all get an opportunity to do every day. And that comes with talking with one another, learning about other people, um, but you also have to share yourself. Yep. And um, so um, I leave you uh, with uh, a, a wish of discovery, empathy, and connectivity. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you learned something. Um, and um, thank you for inviting me here. It was wonderful to share this with you today.